This lesson is on weird or atypical signs and symptoms of lung cancer. Before we talk about those weird or atypical signs and symptoms, let's talk about what lung cancer is and some of the more common symptoms of it. So lung cancer is going to be a cancer of the lung, and we break down lung cancer into multiple types. So one type of lung cancer is known as small cell carcinoma, and the other types are non-small cell carcinomas, and there are multiple types in the non-small cell carcinoma category, and these include adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and bronchial carcinoid tumor. Now, there are many risk factors for getting lung cancer, and each particular risk factor is going to be associated with a particular type of lung cancer. We won't get into all the details here, but if you want more information, please check out my lesson on an in-depth overview of lung cancer. But we will talk about the risk factors in general here. These include tobacco smoking, secondhand smoke exposure, radon exposure. Radon exposure is going to be a very important risk factor in non-smokers. So we can get more radon exposure in particular areas of the world, especially if individuals are living or residing in basements. So in basements or underground in particular parts of the world, we can get more radon exposure and chronic radon exposure increases the risk for lung cancer. Radiation exposure is also another risk factor as well. So if you've had radiation exposure due to radiation therapy, for instance, you're more likely to have certain types of lung cancer. Environmental pollutants are also another risk factor. So in certain cities with a lot of pollution, this can increase the risk for lung cancer. Asbestos exposure is also another risk factor for certain types of lung cancer, especially adenocarcinoma. And then having a family history is also another risk factor. So some of the more common symptoms of lung cancer include a cough, hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood and constitutional symptoms, which include things like fatigue, weight loss, fever, and drenching night sweats at night. So often night sweats are going to be significant in that you can often drench your bedding from them. So those are constitutional symptoms. So these are going to be the more common symptoms of lung cancer. But the topic of this lesson is that we're going to talk about more atypical or weird symptoms of lung cancer that are more specifically going to be related to perineoplastic syndromes that are caused by the lung cancer. So perineoplastic syndromes are going to be where the lung cancer produces either a hormone or some chemical or some antibodies against your own tissues. And it's going to lead to a systemic manifestation. That is what a perineoplastic syndrome is. So we're first going to talk about small cell carcinoma, and a weird or a typical presentation of small cell carcinoma can include Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. So some people that have small cell carcinoma of the lung can have this particular syndrome, and this particular syndrome is going to involve proximal muscle weakness. So weakness of proximal muscles, meaning that muscles that are closer to your core, you can think of it like that, so upper arms, upper legs, for instance. And the key finding with Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome is that it improves with activity. So the muscle weakness improves with more activity. This is going to be in contrast to myasthenia gravis, which occurs with worsening muscle weakness with more activity. So the reason that this syndrome occurs in the first place is that the cancer is producing autoantibodies against presynaptic calcium channels on neurons. So on presynaptic motor neurons, there is calcium channels when activated, allow calcium into the neuron and allow for acetylcholine, an important neurotransmitter, to be released, and that will allow contraction of your muscles. So the problem here is that in Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, there are autoantibodies against these presynaptic calcium channels. So you don't allow the calcium to enter into the neuron to allow the acetylcholine to be released for you to utilize your muscles. But if you utilize your muscles more and more frequently, you can overcome that inhibition of those autoantibodies. This is the reason why there is an improvement with activity. Another atypical manifestation of small cell carcinoma includes perineoplastic myelitis. So this can also be termed as transverse myelitis. So perineoplastic myelitis is going to be an inflammation of the spinal cord, and it can cause many different symptoms, including weakness of the lower limbs and issues with urination. So we can have urinary retention. Those are some of the more characteristic signs and symptoms of myelitis. So that is also another particular atypical presentation of small cell carcinoma. Some other weird or atypical manifestations of small cell carcinoma include encephalitis. So encephalitis is going to be also referred to if it's due to perineoplastic syndrome as perineoplastic encephalomyelitis. 
And it's going to be an inflammation of the brain tissue itself. And in some cases, again, it can involve the spinal cord as well. And this perineal plastic encephalomyelitis is going to be caused by the cancer producing antibodies against central nervous system neurons, either inside the neurons or outside the neurons. And this can lead to inflammation of the brain tissue or the brain parenchyma. And this can lead to a headache, fever, altered mental status, so confusion. Those are going to be the hallmark findings of encephalitis. And we can also see subacute cerebellar degeneration as well occurring in small cell carcinoma patients. So this is going to be immune-mediated perineoplastic syndrome, and it's going to be autoimmunity to Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, and it's going to also be associated with other malignancies. But small cell carcinoma is going to be a characteristic one where we see subacute cerebellar degeneration. So autoantibodies against Purkinje cells of the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is located here, and it is involved in fine motor coordination, and that's going to lead to particular issues in motor coordination. So it's going to often start out with more minor issues like difficulty controlling fine motor movements with your fingers, and it can eventually progress into issues with moving your arms in general, moving your arms or moving your legs in a coordinated fashion. So you may have difficulty over time with coordinated muscle movements due to subacute cerebellar degeneration. Small cell carcinoma can also cause Cushing's syndrome as well. So Cushing's syndrome is going to be where the cancer cells produce and release high amounts of ACTH or adrenocorticotropic hormone, which leads to increased cortisol release from the adrenal cortex. So it is where the cancer cells are producing this hormone, ACTH, that acts on the adrenal cortex. The adrenal cortex is going to be on the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are these endocrine glands that are located above your kidneys, and that causes the release of cortisol. So excessive levels of cortisol occurs, and this excessive level of cortisol is going to lead to particular signs and symptoms, including fat distribution changes. We can often have abdominal obesity, cushing face. This is what a cushing face looks like, so more rounded face. We can also have issues with skin stri or stretch marks and immunosuppression. These are some of the signs and symptoms of Cushing syndrome, but there are many others as well. We can also see syndrome of inappropriate ADH in small cell carcinoma. And small cell carcinoma is actually the most common lung cancer that causes SIADH. And this is going to be due to excessive production and release of antidiuretic hormone or ADH. So this is where we have the name syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. This is going to cause issues with water retention. So it's going to lead to our body essentially holding on to more water, leading to your blood becoming more diluted. That's essentially what happens. And that leads to hyponatremia, which is a low level of sodium or low concentration of sodium in the blood. So that is going to be SIADH. And that occurs also as an atypical manifestation of small cell carcinoma. The next type of lung cancer we're going to talk about is adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma has its own atypical manifestations. These include hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. So this is clubbing of the fingers. We can see clubbing of the fingers in other pulmonary conditions as well. So this is not going to be a very unique feature of adenocarcinoma, but it can occur and it is where the fingers are clubbed, meaning that there's a greater than 180 degrees angulation of the nail bed. So this is what it should look like if we were to put our two index fingers together. We're supposed to see this little hole here, but in the case of clubbing, if we were to put our two index fingers together, this is what we would see. There'd be this increased angulation and we would not see that little space as we should. Again, this is associated with other lung conditions and also associated with many other conditions, including cardiovascular conditions. Now, in addition to finger clubbing in hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, we can also have issues with severe arthralgias or very painful joints, achy, painful joints, and also arthritis, inflammation of joints. And we can see some other abnormalities of bones as well. We can also see perineoplastic dermatomyositis occurring more commonly in adenocarcinoma compared to other lung cancers. Perineoplastic dermatomyositis is going to be essentially polymyositis and dermatomyositis. So this, these are conditions that can occur without cancer, but in the case of perineoplastic dermatomyositis, it is going to be a perineoplastic syndrome. And this is where we can see certain signs and symptoms, including heliotrope rash. So this is where there is a redness around the eyes on the cheeks or eyelids as well. It can appear and mimic 
a malar rash of lupus. You can also see Gautrin's papules as well. These are these reddened papules on the knuckles of the hands more specifically. We can also see it on the elbows as well. And then we can also see shawl sign. This is where there's a rash on the neck and upper back. And we can also see proximal muscle weakness from this particular perineal plastic syndrome as well. So these are all certain signs and symptoms that can occur in perineal plastic dermatomyositis that is a perineal plastic syndrome from lung adenocarcinoma. Now moving on to squamous cell carcinoma, an important atypical manifestation of squamous cell carcinoma is going to be hypercalcemia or a high level of calcium in the blood. This is going to be more particular for this particular type of lung cancer because squamous cell carcinoma cancer cells can produce high levels of parathyroid related peptide or PTHRP. So we're going to have high levels of parathyroid related peptide and this parathyroid related peptide is going to mimic parathyroid hormone that's produced in the parathyroid glands. And these are four glands that are located behind the thyroid gland and they release parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone is going to be important in regulating calcium. So the problem when we have too much PTHRP, this is going to lead to increased absorption of calcium from the gastrointestinal system and increased reabsorption of calcium from the kidneys leading to increased calcium in the blood. So that is how we get high calcium levels in squamous cell carcinoma. Although there is another way we can see high calcium, and that is through metastases to the bone. So if there's metastatic cancer to the bone, that cancer in the bone can damage bone releasing calcium into the blood, and that can also increase calcium as well. So because we see hypercalcemia, there's going to be signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. These include muscle weakness and fasciculations, changes in bowel habits, and altered mental status, among others as well. Now let's talk about large cell carcinoma. Large cell carcinoma is going to lead to increased levels of human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG hormone. So this is going to lead to HCG related manifestations. This is where the cancer cells produce high levels of HCG. HCG is going to be the hormone that's produced during pregnancy, but in this particular cancer, it leads to high levels of this hormone. And because of the high levels of this particular hormone, we see signs and symptoms related to high levels of HCG. These can include the following, gynecomastia in males, so increased growth of breast tissue in males, amenorrhea, and abnormal uterine bleeding in females. So in young female patients, it can mimic pregnancy, so they can have amenorrhea, so they may not have any period at all. Or in older female patients, they can have abnormal uterine bleeding. So those are all particular signs and symptoms related to high levels of HCG. And weird signs and symptoms of bronchial carcinoid tumor is related to carcinoid syndrome. Carcinoid syndrome is going to be due to a production of excessive amounts of serotonin. This is going to lead to characteristic signs and symptoms. So these signs and symptoms can include the following. Flushing, so flushing of the face and diarrhea, especially watery, excessive diarrhea. And we can also see a left-sided heart murmur. So because the cancer is in the lung, it's a carcinoid cancer in the lung, the serotonin is going to be exposed to the left side of the heart. That can lead to a left-sided heart murmur. And we can also see excessive wheezing with this particular type of cancer as well. If you want more information on lung cancer, please check out my full lesson on lung cancer. If you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.